Um, yes, this is an area that is, is particularly dear to my heart in terms of, of working in substance misuse because it's, it's so often um, where we find that we have challenges to face. I'd, I'd just like to let you know before I start, I've got to speak for 45 minutes and for the past about two months I've had this cough which comes every now and then, so if I suddenly start coughing and have to walk away and cough for five minutes, please bear with me. So the question I've been asked to address is why do mental health and substance misuse problems occur so often together? Well, the first question to ask is, well, how common are both of these problems in the general population? So we know about one in four people suffers with mental health problems. If you get into the prison population, that's up to about 90%. What about substance misuse? Well, again, about 24% of people will have will be drinking above recommended limits. They've just changed the recommended limits, so of course that, that may go up. Um, we also know about 8% of people have problems with drugs, and actually that's not the way I've represented it there, because there's a lot of crossovers, a lot of people who use alcohol and drugs. Um, but so we can, we can guess that there's maybe about a quarter of the population who've also got a problem with substance misuse. So how often do they overlap? Well, if one protected from the other, then they would be kind of like sheep and goats. You'd have 25% of the population with mental health problems, 25% with substance misuse problems, and 50% of people who were fine and had neither. But we know that that's not really the case, is it? If it was just chance in terms of of crossing over, you've got one in, a one in four chance of having a mental health problem, you've got a one in four chance of having a substance misuse problem, then they would overlap in about one in 16 people, so about 8%. So if it was just simply a matter of you throw the dice, the four-sided dice, if you get a four, you get a mental health problem, you throw it again, um, and if you get a four, you get a substance misuse problem as well, literally only about 8% of people would have that. So is that what we see? Well. If we look at people with severe mental health problems, if we expect one in four of them to have a mental health problem, actually what we find is about a third to a half of them have a substance misuse problem as well. So it's clearly not just chance that's going on there. Most of that's alcohol, then cannabis, and then kind of the rest. What about if we look at a substance misuse population, so the kind of people that we see in our service, the Norfolk Recovery Partnership, Again, we would expect, by chance, about a quarter of them to have mental health problems. But actually, we find a whopping half to three quarters of them have mental health problems. And that's not just national data, that's our own data looking locally. Twice in the last 10 years that I've worked in the service, we've done a survey of how many of our patients actually have a mental health problem, and we found sort of 60 to 70% on both occasions. Most commonly, that's anxiety and depression, but not just those problems. So it's not just chance, there's something else going on. So what could it be? Well, part of it's going to be just chance. What about the fact that they perhaps both have similar risk factors? So if you're likely to, if you've got risk factors that make you more likely to have a mental health problem, then perhaps you're also more likely to have a substance misuse problem. Well, let's have a look at what the risk factors are. So for mental health, we know genetics is a, is a huge issue. If you look at particularly depression, um, the studies show that probably about 70% of the variability is actually just down to your genetics, the way that you're programmed. And then there's the impact of the intrauterine environment, so what your mother's mental health was whilst she was pregnant. We know that being anxious and depressed while you're pregnant and also postpartum can have an impact on development. Also, whether your mum was drinking, taking drugs. And then there's your childhood environment. There's the issues of, of family dysfunction, of neglect, abuse, trauma, problems at school, and then on into adulthood, other forms of adversity that we experience as, adulthoods, as, as adults, so other sort of life events. And then there's physical health problems. We know people who have chronic pain are more likely to suffer with mental health problems. If you have disability, um, people with infections, etc. And also your social circumstances. So we know that in terms of mental health, particularly, if you're lower in the sort of social system, you're more likely to suffer with mental health problems, partly um, to do with the stress of living in that section of society, but also because if you have a mental health problem, you'll often drift down, what we call social drift, down the, 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 the sort of social slope. So let's compare that with the risk factors for substance misuse. And we find that actually they're pretty much identical. So it's not surprising that people who end up with a mental health problem are also more likely to end up with a substance misuse problem. 
So we know that both of these things are true. By chance, there would be a big crossover, but also they've got these common risk factors. What about the issue of mental health causing a substance misuse problem? Well, let's think about that in terms of, firstly, why does anyone take drugs or alcohol? Well, first of all, you feel happier, you feel more confident. So you're, you know, you're, you're worried about going out to a party, you take a drug, you feel a little bit more confident about going, you're more sociable, you're more outgoing. You feel less anxious, sad, bored, cope better with anger, frustration, physical pain, mental pain. It's what your mates do, so you do it with your mates. Or you do it instead of having mates. You do it to have fun, and you do it to help you sleep. There's an interesting study. Um, I'm not completely sure how I feel ethically about it. Um, but it, I think it has a really important kind of look at, at, at one of the reasons why people take drugs. This is a, a study where they looked at monkeys. When they were on their own, now monkeys are social animals like us. We're, they have brains very similar to us and they like being in, in social groups. So individually housed, what you'll see on the, I think for you, the left side, you can see that the, um, the, the happy parts of the brain, um, the reward centres, are not very well lit up. At the top for the dominant monkeys and the bottom for the subordinate monkeys, they look pretty much the same on the left-hand side. And they're given the opportunity to take cocaine, and they do, because they're miserable. You then house them together, and what you see is the dominant monkeys, their reward centres start to light up, because other monkeys pay attention to them, they groom them, they get their way, they get access to the females, etc. For the subordinate monkeys, it doesn't. And what you see is they carry on taking cocaine, and the other ones don't. So if you think about that in terms of our own social structures, um, I think that has kind of some really important parallels. So why do people with mental health problems take drugs? Well, it's cheaper than therapy. It's sometimes quite a lot easier to access than therapy. And actually, if we look down those issues around for why do other people take drugs, well, if you have a mental health problem, you're more likely to feel sad, underconfident, to have low self-esteem. So you might have a little bit more motivation to take a drug that makes you feel good. You're more likely to feel anxious, angry, confused, have voices. Now, there are some drugs which will make voices worse, but there are others which actually may help to damp them down. You're more likely not to have any kind of meaningful thing to do in your day. You're more likely to have sleep problems, and you're more likely to be lonely and isolated. You're also more likely to have poor impulse control, either through disinhibition as a result of your mental health problem or because you're disengaged and have less motivation to care for yourself. You become um, very reckless in terms of, of your own self-care. So if we look at a, a, a sort of anonymised case and think about what's going on here, Matt was a heroin and amphetamine groin injector. He had chronic low mood and low self-esteem. He had undiagnosed ADHD as a child. His mum was a drinker. There was family separation. He disengaged with school early, partly because of the problems with his ADHD, made it difficult for him to concentrate, to get on with his peers. He was perceived as naughty and difficult. He was more difficult at home for mum to cope with. Mum was struggling already. Then as an adult, he lost his wife. She was also a drug user. She died of an overdose, and, and he woke up one day, and, and, and she was, she'd passed away. Almost immediately, the kids were adopted away, so he lost his whole family within the space of a few days. He's in chronic pain because he had a partial amputation, um, and he had a, a, a clot in his leg as a result of the groin injecting. He's recently been housed, previously homeless, but he's in a pretty rancid flat. Uh, where he's being exploited by local dealers who have access to his flat, he finds it difficult to tell them to go away. So why does he take drugs? Well, if you ask him, he says, well, it blocks out my bad memories and my bad emotions, gives me a brief period of feeling like I've got some energy, I've got a, 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 a little, you know, lifts my mood briefly, I feel less worthless, I don't feel so isolated and bored, all my friends or associates are drug users, and it's become a habit, that's what I do now. So if we think about the possibility that mental health causes substance misuse, we can say, yes, actually, there are issues that would suggest that you're more likely 
to use drugs if you have those other problems. What about the other way around? What about substance misuse causing a mental health problem? Well, what happens when people, particularly people with mental health problems, take drugs? A lot of the people that I see will tell me that they are taking drugs as a form of self-medication. The question is, is it effective? Does it work? So, there's three different areas to think about in terms of, of using substances. One is what happens when you're intoxicated. One is what happens when you're using it regularly for a long period of time. And another is what happens when you then stop using it. So let's think about alcohol. So you start off anxious and depressed. Sorry about that. So you get intoxicated. And briefly, that makes you feel a bit better. It's a sedative, it makes you feel more relaxed and happy. So you think about it as self-medication. It's treating my anxiety and depression. You carry on using it every day. <coughs> what we know is that regular use of alcohol is brilliantly good at making you depressed and anxious. You also see more PTSD, social anxiety, agoraphobia, and also impact on your cognitive function. So there's a lot of alcohol-related brain disease. So you start to see your memory gets worse, your concentration gets worse, your <coughs> decision-making gets worse. So you do things that frustrate you. You lose stuff, you say things you shouldn't have said, and that feeds again into your poor self-esteem and your low mood. So you decide to stop. And what happens as a result of withdrawal symptoms is that you feel anxious and your mood feels very raw and unstable, so you feel more anxious and depressed. So actually, although it might seem in the early phases that this is a good form of self-medication, actually as you go through this process, what happens is that the anxiety and depression gets worse. Why does this happen? Well, it's down to something called neuroadaptation. This is a little bit of kind of brain science. Um, what happens is that your body likes things to be in balance. So if you think about things like your pulse, your temperature, your blood pressure, it's kept within quite tight boundaries. And there's all sorts of feedback mechanisms that make sure that if your heart rate starts to go up too much, you slow it down. If your temperature starts to go up too much, you bring it down. So all of these mechanisms are about holding your body in balance. It's called, uh, it has a long word called homeostasis. Now, in your brain, broadly speaking, there is a balance between natural stimulant and natural sedative, so that you're awake, you're alert, but you're not driven and running around like a headless chicken. So you start taking drugs, some kind of sedative drug, so alcohol or, 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 or heroin. And what happens is that you get out of balance. So you're intoxicated, you're sedated, um, you're sort of relaxed and happy, etc. You're kind of, you're drunk. If you keep using, what happens is your body ups that natural stimulant to balance out all the sedative that you're pouring in. And that brings you to a state of what we call tolerance. So, some, for example, you know, I, I was speaking to a guy yesterday who was drinking a bottle and half of, a litre and a half of vodka a day. Now, if I were to drink a litre and a half of vodka, I'd be unconscious on the floor. But he was sat up, perfectly rational, not apparently drunk, talking to me. And that's because his body had adapted. His brain had upped his natural stimulant so he could take all that sedative and actually still appear to be relatively normal. And in our society, we think of this as a good thing. We talk about people who, you know, oh, they can really hold their beer. And people who are a bit of a lightweight, um, and they have a couple of glasses of wine and they're, they're a bit tipsy. So our, our kind of social perceptions are a bit out of balance, aren't they, in terms of actually what's healthy. Because what happens when you stop, and this can just be literally a case of, you know, a, a, the sort of, bottle and a half of vodka level, that might just be stopping overnight. It might be stopping for a few hours so that you can get some sleep, or stopping because you've run out of money, or because you have to go somewhere where you know that you can't smell of alcohol. So you've stopped pouring your sedative in, what happens is that you're then in withdrawal, you're out of balance, because you've still got all that natural stimulant left, but you've stopped pouring the sedative in. And when you've got all of that stimulant there, what happens is you feel anxious, agitated, shaky, and at the very extreme end, you can start to hallucinate, have fits, etc. 
So that's the kind of the, the, the brain explanation of what's going on when we see people with their anxiety and, and their depression getting worse when they've been drinking for a long time. What about other drugs, things like stimulants? Well, we know, again, that when you take a stimulant, the point is to make you feel happy and confident and you've got more energy um, and it suppresses your appetite. If you take too much, you're going to start to get anxious and paranoid and psychotic, the kind of symptoms that you get when you're withdrawing from a sedative. If you use them regularly, you start to kind of wear out these systems. So you start to get anxious, paranoid, depressed, tired all the time. And when you withdraw... What happens, you've had all your happy chemicals, you've, you've used them all up, and then you, you, you kind of end up in this really deep depression, what we call anhedonia, where you really can't see any good in the world. Everything seems very bleak. There doesn't seem to be any possibility that you're going to feel happy again. And you get a really strong craving to take the drug. What about opioids? So things like heroin, morphine, tramadol, etc. Well, again, the into this is, these are sedative drugs again. So intoxication, you feel euphoric. You get that warm, cosy blanket feeling. Remember someone saying to me when they, when they found heroin, it was like the cuddles that they'd never had. Chronic use, it becomes the only thing that's important. Your whole brain becomes focused because this hits your reward centre and your reward centre is what guides your motivation. So if you think about, for example, um, so, you know, a crocodile or you know, a very simple animal, if you do something that gets you food or finds you a mate, it hits your reward center, your brain learns that's a good behavior, do it again. So these are very primitive kind of loops that happen in your brain. All of the drugs that we abuse hit the reward center. So if they activate that, whatever you just did, whether it's injecting yourself with heroin or having a beer or snorting some cocaine, your brain learns that that's a good thing to do, do it again. So it becomes really automatic, ingrained behavior. And this is what happens with opioids, particularly what you find is that it becomes the most important thing. So everything else in your life falls away. So you lose your relationships, you lose interest in the other things that you used to do. And your whole life becomes around getting this. And then, of course, that has huge impacts on how your life is in terms of your functioning, of having somewhere safe to live, your money, your relationships, your job, etc. Chronic use can also directly, as a result of the drugs, lead to quite a flat mood. Because this kind of suppresses all that emotional variability that we normally have. So when you withdraw, those emotions come back and they feel like a tidal wave. It's, it's overwhelming. And one of the things that's most difficult for people when they're withdrawing from opioids is that onslaught of emotions that they just don't know how to deal with. Because their single coping strategy has been to take something. And if that's not what you're going to do anymore, then, then what do you do? when you're hit with this tidal wave of emotion. You're also perhaps going to start feeling physical pains that you have not been noticing for a while. And of course, you'll be craving for the drug. So when people say, why don't they just stop? They can see that it's, you know, it's bad, it's causing them all these health problems, and it's causing them all these family problems, etc. Why on earth, why don't they just stop? Well, I guess the question that I tend to ask most people, you know, I look at an audience and I say, OK, how many of you in the audience have ever tried to change anything in your life, whether it be not biting your nails or doing some more exercise or sticking to a diet? How many people have ever tried to do anything? Just stick your hand up. Okay, I want you to keep your hand up. If the first time you tried to do that, you just did it and carried on with it, you can put your hand down. The rest of us keep our hands up. Yeah? It's not that easy, is it? Even to make what seem like relatively small changes, like maybe stopping biting your nails. And what you've got to bear in mind is that when most of us are trying to make those kind of changes, we're doing it in a situation where we have other coping strategies, where we have other things that we do to treat ourselves, where we have other things that we do to keep us occupied. We have safe accommodation. We have friends that we can um, look to to help us out. So when people say they're not motivated, it's really important to remember that motivation fluctuates in all of us. 
It's something that, you know, you might go to bed at night and think, I'll never drink again, or I will get up and I'll go for a run tomorrow morning. And then you wake up and it's a bit dark and rainy and you think, you know what, maybe I'll start tomorrow. I'm a bit tired today. I've had a bad week. There's all these different ways that we give ourselves excuses not to make that change. And these are minor things. So I think it's really important to bear that in mind when, when you know, people turn around and say, well, they're, more, you know, they're not motivated, why don't they stop? If we go back to thinking about Matt, well, he does want to give up. He feels ill, he's in pain, he can't live with the chaos, he's scared of the people that he's um, associating with, and he wants his mum back. He wants his mum to want to talk to him again. But he just can't cope when he's withdrawing. The idea of being drug-free scares him. He's now in his mid-30s, he's been taking drugs for the last 20 years, he doesn't know who he is without drugs in his system, and that's quite a scary thought. And actually, he doesn't really feel like he's worth trying to save. There's a lot of effort involved in, in, in going through um, recovery from substance misuse. And if you don't really care that much about yourself, why would you put all that effort in? So that's where you get this kind of ambivalence. Even though people do really want to change, actually, there's a large part of them that can't face it. So what we come down to is that the nature of the relationship between mental health and substance misuse is really complicated and any of this list of, of, of issues that we've just looked at below could apply in any individual. But it's also more than that. What, what about the impact of mental health and substance misuse on response to treatment for either of those disorders? Well. People who have both are less likely to attend appointments because they're chaotic, because they forget, because they've got other priorities. They often will not take medications as prescribed. Now, I don't mean that in a pejorative way. 30% only of drugs prescribed by GPs are taken as prescribed. So it's not just this population that is creative about the way they use medication, but they are perhaps a little bit more creative than the general population. They generally have a poorer response to treatment. Now, that might be because of the substances they're using. They're more likely to act on thoughts of suicide, self-harm, or harm to others, mostly the first two. Um, and I get very tired of hearing, oh, well, we can't assess this person who's suicidal because they're intoxicated. Well, actually, they're more likely to act on those thoughts when they're intoxicated. They are, in fact, 100 times more likely to act on those thoughts when they're intoxicated. And these guys are more likely to end up in inpatient treatment. They also accrue physical health problems. So when you're intoxicated or when you're depressed and you throw yourself out of a window or you cut yourself, etc., you cause physical harm. And sometimes this causes problems which result in chronic pain or chronic disability. You're more likely to get assaulted both physically and sexually. You're more likely to acquire infections, to have breathing problems. Um, partly due to the stuff that we've already talked about. We also know that people who have mental health problems are more likely to be smoking as well. They're less likely to engage with general medical services with GPs. Sometimes, sadly, GPs are less likely to engage with them too because sometimes they can seem difficult. So there's all these issues around chronic pain and disability and failure to engage with treatment or treatment to engage with them as well. They're also more likely to accrue psychological trauma. Um, so, as I say, it's one thing in terms of the physical sequelae of having an assault, but also there's a, there's a psychological sequelae to that. They're more likely to be living in situations where they're suffering domestic abuse. They're more likely to witness traumatic events. You talk to um, long-term heroin users, all of them will have seen people die, um, often friends, often relatives. They may also... Um, have lost what I think of as, as their locus of safety. So they don't have a safe home to go to. Um, they're living in an environment where they don't feel safe when they go to st or try to go to sleep. They've lost some of those possessions which have sentimental value that anchor you to your world. They've lost people. They, they may have had their children taken away. They may have lost their partners. They may have lost contact with their family, their friends. They may have been subject to threats um, which... Again, you know, we talk to people and they say, well, I think people are out to get me. Are they paranoid? Are they delusional? Well, actually, is that reality for them? Um, often that is, in fact, the case. So what are the implications? Well, it's a worse outcome for both the mental health and the substance misuse disorder, and I could have added there the physical health disorder as well. They say they're more likely to harm themselves or others, and they're more likely to be homeless, isolated, exploited, not have anything meaningful to do, which builds their self-esteem and keeps them occupied, 
and they're more likely to be bouncing in and out of the criminal justice system. They also, unfortunately, will experience stigma. And then, of course, there's the wider impact, as you guys will know, because you're here for a carers' forum on the mental and physical health of carers and the family. So when we, when we used to talk about dual diagnosis, we used to say substance misuse and a mental health problem is dual diagnosis. I don't think that's what it is. I love this quote from the service user. Dual diagnosis is a label they give you, but even at my most buoyant, I think I've got more than two problems. <laughs> I prefer to think of it in terms of what, what I call multimorbidity or complex needs. And this is a quote from The Lancet, which is one of the most kind of highly respected medical journals. Existing health systems are dominated by single disease approaches that are increasingly inappropriate and need to be complemented by strengthening generalism in both specialist and primary care. And it's important to remember and be aware that primary care is really struggling at the moment. Um, and, and one of the things that we perhaps all need to do is start to step up in terms of our citizenship um, and, and our voice as a, as a member of the population in terms of actually what needs to be happening, what, what do we need to protect, where do our resources need to go as a society. Physical and mental health care is particularly divided despite the prevalence of physical and mental comorbidity. We need to actually think about the whole person and we need to think about all of their needs. This is, I don't know if how many of you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy, but the bottom is the stuff that you just need, oxygen, food, water, shelter, and then your security needs, so that need for psychological and physical security, your social needs, acceptance and belonging, your need for self-esteem, recognition, and self-actualization when you start to get into more of the sort of spiritual zones. So we need services that actually address all of those issues and actually look at people as a whole person. So we need to be thinking about accommodation, education and training, social and cultural and spiritual life, finance and money, parenting, caring, you know, all of these things. Not just the one-to-one -one relationships, but also the relationships with staff and the relationships of staff who are working with an individual with each other. So the wider network um, and also about people's families. We need services which are linked up which are focused on individuals, which are compassionate, respectful, creative, and provided in partnership with the people who use them. And that's it. Any questions? 